blindsided by anxiety. Now, most people process their emotions in one of two ways. And if you've tried them both, it's still hard to get a grip on anxiety. So today, I want to offer a fresh approach. Maybe an approach that you haven't considered or tried. And I want to encourage you today that if you try this approach, then it has a way of actually both validating your emotions and helps you to overcome anxiety. Now, let me ask you this for a moment. Uh, how were you raised? Uh, look, there's really a how were you raised in what home and then how you turned out. There's a two-part question. But let me say, uh, you know, on one end of the emotional uh, response, uh, maybe you were raised in a home that was very loud, expressive, bent all their emotions. I mean, you didn't have to wonder about what they were saying uh, or wonder about what they were thinking because they told you. In fact, most of the folks in this camp are actually awed by their emotions so much that they will follow their emotions and say too much and then have to backtrack because they said too much and they have to come back and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so let me see who was raised in, in that type of environment. Okay, now what, what's interesting to me, so are you, if you were raised in that uh, type of environment, are you that way? No, some, some are, some not. Okay, so on the other side, some are very expressive, some vent, some just shell out all of their different emotions. Now, the other side seems to almost to cover up their emotions, to push them down, try to manage, even deny or suppress their emotions. Uh, if you're smiling right now, that's you. Uh, maybe you were, maybe you were, raised in that type thing and it's not it's it's almost like we've got to not let these emotions get control over us uh, to rule us you know who who was raised in that type okay now what's what's interesting some of you maybe if you were raised in that you're just that same way and then some of you are the exact opposite but you've tried both sides uh, and you've experienced both sides but how can we get a grip on anxiety because we all face it. You know, anxiety is like this ferocious monster that is constantly in pursuit of us, trying to steal our energy, to kill our hope, and to actually destroy our thoughts. It's interesting, one of the earliest psychologists in this area Rollo May, how would you like for your name is Rollo? Rollo May, in 1967, wrote a book, and he offers some interesting insights to me uh, on some ways that maybe we look at both fear and anxiety that, that I haven't really considered before. One, he said, fear is a temporary response to a specific danger to which an individual can make a specific in judgment. So in other words, he's saying fear is that okay, my, my blood pressure raises, my adrenaline rises, and I have to make this, this initial response. I, I mean, I, it, it compels me to, to react, to respond. Whether that's a good way or bad, I mean, there's a compelling to respond. And then he's gone ahead and, and subdivided anxiety as, as a different level type fear. Now, understanding all this is very technical, but he said that anxiety is more of a prolonged feeling of weakness and uncertainty and the experience of helplessness toward any kind of threat. Uh, in, in my terms, I would say, by, based on that description, that, that fear would more be an initial reaction and anxiety would be if you put, crock, put fear in a crock pot and let it simmer for a while. You know what I'm talking about? It kind of, I mean, it, it just kind of goes on and you think about it a long time and it kind of oozes in and there, you know, add, sprinkle a little bit of cloudiness in uh, and, and, and just a, a tiredness and oppression, almost a weight, a pressing down. Now we're getting close to anxiety. And what's interesting, there's lots of levels to anxiety as far as there's a chemical uh, portion of it uh, that you have to contend with. There's a reactive portion of anxiety. Uh, in my experience, that's when you press 
uh, down the accelerator of your life and you feel like the adrenaline's going all the time, that would be the reactive form of anxiety. It's like, I can't let it off. I'm just, you know, I keep going. I can't slow down. That, that, that would be part of anxiety. And then there's also a traumatic point of, of anxiety where, you know, some kind of, you know, traumatic event basically throws you into uh, this, this type feeling and different things. Here's what I would propose, regardless of the situation. Again, this is a very, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, okay, you have anxiety. I can cure that in about 30 minutes. No, I, I, I get that this is an ongoing, this is a difficult thing that we've got to work through. But I, I think that we can both validate our emotions and encourage you in the overcoming process. And if we were to look at this and to zero it down, we would determine that anxiety at its root, root cause spiritual. So that's why we need to come together and think through that. Now, so what I want to do, I don't even have to ask you, are you having to deal with anxiety? I can just ask you about maybe today or, or yesterday or, you know, a couple days and, and, and we'll hit on it. Uh, and so let's lean into the father and ask him to reveal a fresh approach today uh, because he knows exactly where you are. God, I come and I thank you for these here. And I, I am so looking forward to your word because I believe it has some keys to life. And God, forgive us where uh, we have tried to control or uncover or figure it out and just run into so many dead ends. And we keep just kind of repeating these cycles of endless anxiety and fear. And God, I pray that you would show your light of truth down upon us. And I just claim the truth that when your word goes out, it will accomplish all that you've said it to accomplish. So I believe that in my whole heart today. God, I pray that you would use the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing in your sight because you're my rock and my redeemer. And God, I just cry out and, and would ask that you relieve us from anxiety, that you relieve us from figuring out of, of all these emotions that come, that you give us a better way, a fresh approach. We trust you in advance. In Jesus' name we agree. Amen. So we're going to spend some time uh, thinking about this uh, through the perspective of Psalm 3. Now, to get into to Psalm 3, there's some things that we need to understand. One, this is a Psalm of David. Uh, and if you look in 2 Samuel 15, 16, 17, you see the actual events that were going on in David's life. Some intensity going on. David's son, Absalom, got together a military coup to win the hearts of the people, to ruin his dad and ultimately kill him, and take over the kingdom for himself. And you start feeling a little bit of the intensity that he's got going on. And so David, King David, pushed out of the palace uh, with just barely what he can grab in a moment, like the emergency, kind of like the Harvey thing, you know, when it was finally time to go, it's just like, grab what you're going to grab and get out of town. That's what David, where David's at. Destruction is coming. People are after him, and he's got to leave. And he leaves just battling all of this. You know, he's, the circumstances are crazy, and he's feeling crazy. And Psalm 3 is actually this fresh approach to understanding and, and dealing with our emotions in a time like this, and then also trying to, to, to deal with our circumstances in a healthy way. So, I want you to, to read this with me, would you? This is Psalm 3, 1 through 2. Come on. Hold on. Look at me on my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul. Selah is kind of just like this emotional expression, kind of, <sighs> I don't think you really got this. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a psalm. We're talking about poetry. We're talking about something that's on a different layer. And sometimes I think we read the Bible and we don't connect because you don't understand my fear and my anxiety. Can, can I peel back some layers on this a little bit? He says, oh Lord, how many are my foes? The text tells us there are 12,000 armed soldiers ready to take him out. You had, everybody, had anybody after you? 
12,000 armed soldiers ready to take out his little posse, you know, family and some of the, the, the house of, of, you know, the kingdom, maybe, uh, you know, a couple hundred people. And he's on the run. 12,000 people are pursuing him. Do you think this might create a little fear? Okay. Okay. So at this point, his blood pressure is rising. His adrenaline's pumping. He's looking over his shoulder because 12,000 people are going, I want to be the one that kills him. Okay. So he's going, many are my foes. I mean, many are rising against me. I mean, this has got to be almost in a pant. Many are my foes. Many are, are those rising against me. And just so you know, there, yes, there's that initial fear, but I want you to see the anxiety here. Because he, he says, many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. What, what are they doing? Well, to get a little bit back in David's story, remember David's a nobody. And God chooses him. He's the ape. He's the runt of the family. And God chooses him and says, I'm going to anoint you king. I'm going to give you provision. I'm going to give you protection. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you power. And all this is coming to you. So David had this happen. But David's heart strayed. And so David began to think his gifts and his talents and all that God had given to him were for his own use, and so he just started selfishly using them for himself, and it started a moral, a spiritual, spiritual, actually a nation decline. And he gets to this point, to where people are saying, David's not that much on a king. They're attacking his character. They're attacking his title. They're attacking all who he is. They're attacking his calling. They're attacking his family. They're even whispering, maybe God's through with him. There's an anxiety plus an end on you. Now I want you to read the psalm a different way because I want you to lean in and, and see this as God understands your anxiety and your fear. To me, it should go more like this. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. oh, Lord. How many are my foes? They're rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation in God. <sighs> Scripture is real. He knows where you are. He knows your fears. He knows your anxiety. And sometimes it just feels good for somebody else to go, I get you. You had 12,000 people after you trying to kill you. Felt the weight of all of your life not mattering anymore and people just saying you don't matter anymore. It's exactly where he's at. It's exactly where he's at. Well, how can we deal with all the emotion of this? How can we deal with all these circumstances? Well, Finally, I think, gave David a fresh approach. Notice what David didn't do. Did David just give full bent to his emotions and get out two swords and just like, ah, and just you know, go chop city on everybody, verbally go crazy on everybody? He could have because maybe that's the way he was raised. Did David just cover it up and suppress it and say, oh, these aren't real emotions. Oh, it's, it's going to be okay. And just give himself a little pep talk and just press it down? No! I think God gave him a fresh approach. Now remember, this is a man on the run, and we get the beauty of seeing and hearing what he's saying. I mean, he's, he's taking time to scribble this down in the middle of this craziness. And he turns and says, Yahweh, the ultimate God, I look to you. You, you desire a relationship with me. That, with me. That's, that's O Lord. And he says, how, how many are my foes? How many are those that rise against me? They're saying of me things that I just can't bear. They are crushing me. So how can we validate our emotions and start to overcome anxiety? Here's a key, and you're going to have to try it. Go ahead and identify the source of your fear and anxiety. 
Now, what most of the time we do, we start taking scenarios about it, and we start thinking our vengeance plans of how we're going to go kung fu on them and blow up their house, and we start thinking all these things. But could you for a moment drive your emotions, drive your, your, your intellect towards thinking of where's the source of my fear and my anxiety? That's hard, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to go ahead and go, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say this is what it is. Not, not about this or how you reacted to me and then I reacted to you. No, 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 no. I'm not following all that jazz, okay? If you want a different way, I'm not asking you to invent it. I'm not asking you to cover it up because you've tried that. Go ahead and identify the source of your anxiety and fear. That's what he was doing. He said, man, there's 12,000 people after me trying to kill me. It's got me freaked out. And just the oppression of just hearing people over and over and over just saying, you're not all that, David. You, know, you maybe never were all that, David. And who are you? Get out of here. We're not following you. We're following somebody else. You stink. You failed, David. Remember how you killed that guy? Remember how you committed that moral? Remember how you... And, and they just start listing all the things off and just say, you're nothing. We're not going to follow you. And David comes back and goes, you know what? All of that's creating this massive fear and anxiety in him. So how does he respond? This is the hard part. He identifies the source of his anxiety and fear. Where? In prayer. There is just something about taking this into the presence of God that gives us a fresh approach. Uh, and, and this is beautiful because we see that God doesn't go, oh, don't say that. Or God doesn't say, you know, go ahead and let that. No, no, no. God lets him still be him, but there is something different in taking it out in prayer that starts a healing. Look, he's just, he's just commenting on the present moment. And he's, he's telling about all the, the oppression that he's feeling with the weight of anxiety. But where is he doing this? It's so important. In the presence of God. So I'm going to ask you to take a journey today, this week. Instead of trying just to vent it, trying to, to, to post some online thing about it, instead of trying to convince one of your buddies, your friends, or somebody else in your family what you're doing and why you're doing it is good, and somebody to give you sympathy that you don't need. Come on. Just having church, aren't we? Then let's try a different approach and express it in the presence of God. Remember, David's writing this on the run. And he are a shield about me. Again, I, I love this, that, that God tells us what we need to know right where we are. You're a shield. Now, when do you use a shield? Do you use a shield if you're, if you're not going into battle? No, that should tell us something, okay? So if he says you're a shield uh, uh, that's, that's about me, and, and this isn't a Captain America shield, you know, one of those buckler shields. You know, you use that, what, go bang, you know, come up, quack, you know, something like that. This is not talking about that. This is a picture of what they call a war door shield. I mean, this is one of the big shields. Why? So you can get behind it because if you're using a war door shield, you're going to into battle to see something that's after you, okay? Uh, this would be like this fortress, and I, we're, the general is leading us, and they're going to throw spears and arrows and hot lava and everything upon us, and we just have to hunker by behind it, and we have to keep pressing forward. Because if you turn around, what's going to happen? You're going to be in big trouble quick, okay? And so he says, God, you're a shield about me. You know, so he's identified the source of his fear and his emotions. And then he immediately turns and he says, God, you're my shield. You're the one that is leading and sustaining me. Now, it's important for us to understand that God's not saying that you're, I'm just going to pull you out of the anxiety. I'm just going to you know, do one of these things and just, you know, totally yeah, 
Make anxiety part like the waters on the Red Sea. That's what we want, isn't it? We would like for God to, to do something like that and just part everything and so we can keep doing what we wanted to do anyway. Is that reality? He could if he wanted to, but my most often experience is it doesn't happen that way. He says, I'll be your shield. I'll go into it with you as you face me. You know, it's interesting that the shield only works as you're pressing into battle and not running away from battle. So if I'm following God into what he says, then there's some protection. But if I'm running away from what he's saying, the shield's there. Is there the protection? No. So just because you're a good person or you were whatever from back then, do you have the assurance of protection? No. Where's the protection? Where's the shield? For those that are going the same direction as God. So how can we validate our emotions, overcome anxiety? Well, we're going to have to, and this is hard, we're going to have to move our focus from our circumstances and our feelings to God's character and my obedience. So I'm going to have to change. I'm not going to operate, this is how I feel. I'm going to have to change of, this is my circumstances. I'm going to have to change of, God, you are my shield, and I'm just going to do the next right thing to follow you. Makes life a little bit easier. I'm just going to do the next right thing to follow you. Because as I go after you, then I'm protected. Now, what is the shield's purpose? It's to protect the parts. Some damage with the shield. You could. But it's there to protect your most vital parts. But here's the thing. You'll be more protected in going behind the shield in obedience than even a a little bit of disobedience is going to get you in trouble. Move the focus from our circumstances and our feelings to a to God's character and my obedience. Why? Because fear and anxiety is going to cause you to start looking for a shield. You're going to look for things in your life to go ahead and validate try to cover you up so that you can keep moving forward. This is how it looks. Maybe you go, well, I'm not that good at this. Try to get behind the shield, cover you up of, of some, well, you kind of trump card. Or I'm a patient wife. Or I'm the model employee. Or I'm a philanthropist. Or I volunteer. And have you known people? That just go ahead and you you go, there's this list of all these other things, but go, but all oh, aren't they loving and compassionate? Well, against anxiety, big whoop, come on. It's not going to cover you in times of battle. And so I, I'd just rather say it. You're going to be looking for a shield. There's only one that will save you and carry you forward. And, and could I say, even in the battle, even if pursuing God, you still go after pain and hardship and suffering because does God promise he's going to erase all of that? No. Even if you're pursuing him and you're still in the middle of pain, hardship, and suffering, understand that that may be God's will for you and he actually may be protecting you from some other things that you could not understand. And that small wound would be better than that huge catastrophe that he could cause that, that he sees that could happen in your life, but you've chosen to follow after him and still take the bruising and the hardship and the pain of being in obedience. So don't come down on yourself and go, yeah, but if I had this just erased in my life, no, it may be very well God's provision for you of something else that would blow up generationally. God is that good. He says, but you are my shield. You, O oh Lord, are my glory. It's this Hebrew word, kavod. It, it, it represents 
a heaviness, a, a, an importance, a significance, a, a, a weighty status. He, he said, you are my purpose, my, my life, my, my meaning. You, you, O Lord, are above all. Now, how do you get to that point? I mean, is that just an easy declaration to where you go, okay, you're all that. I mean, he's had all of these things happen. He's got people chasing him, trying to kill him. He's crushed my anxiety. How does he go from, uh, I've got a shield about me, to, God, you're, you, are, you are my kavod. You are my... I think... It comes down to understanding that if he has to say that, God, you're my glory, then that gives us an understanding that he had something else that he tried to make his glory, and it didn't work. So he's had to go through and start repenting of embezzled glory that God should have been getting in his life. He had to go through, God, you, you made me a great warrior, and I've got the Goliath story all day. And that's not what makes me anymore, because that didn't sustain me. God, you, you've made me king. That's what doesn't sustain me anymore. And God, you've made my family large and big and amazing, and that's not what sustained me. And God, I tried to make it about relationships and I messed it up and I even killed for it. And that's not what sustains me. And he goes through and he takes off the altar of his life those things that he's placed his glory in. What other people thought. Wealth and power and significance. And he's lowered them down and says, God, no, no, no. You understand, you're my glory. Oh, this is a tough process. But do you really want to get rid of your anxiety? I like what Tim Keller says. David's anxiety is like smoke from a fire burning of his misplaced glory, his kavod. So in other words, as David's feeling this anxiety and this pressure in his life, what is happening is it's from, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of misplaced glory that God should have been getting and we've been putting in and on other things and other people. You know what I see happen too often? Is that people start addressing, they, they, they feel the anxiety and they feel the pressure of the anxiety and they start addressing the smoke of the anxiety instead of the fire of misplaced glory that God should be getting. You hearing this? Don't miss this. You hearing it? So anxiety is but misplaced glory upon God, and it's coming up as a symptom. Oh, and then we're good at medicating the symptom, aren't we? We start coping with, with drugs and alcohol and sleep and food and exercise and wealth and power and titles. We start going, well, but if I just had this ideal past, if I just had this amazing future, then I would be all of that. And we're just attacking the symptoms. We're not attacking the fire and it's eating us up. It's time to repent. Did you know that there will come a day? I can absolutely say, there will come a day when everything that you and I have are worth in whether it's people or things from this world will fail us. And it may come from a traumatic event it, at your deathbed. It may come in a thousand little deaths that just happen slowly every day. But it will happen. Why? Because those things will burn away and you and I will be faced with where is our glory David gets to the point where he puts those things intentionally down 
and says, God, you're my glory. And I want all of my meaning and significance and purpose to be because you love me and you care for me and you pursue me. So every other thing is secondary to that. Oh, this is difficult, isn't it? You're going like, let me breathe. This is difficult. But folks, I, I, I so desire. Do you want to keep carrying the bricks of anxiety? No. So go ahead and identify the source. Go ahead and start transferring from the circumstances and the feelings to God's character and your next step of obedience and then start repenting of those things that you know without somebody drawing your line that you've allowed to burn deep down within you, whether it's a memory of the past or it's a something of, of the future, whether it's, it's, it's a goal, whatever it is, you've misplaced your glory on something that will not last. And you know what? God is getting your attention by pressing in on you. This may not be something of the enemy at all. This may be God trying to press in on you so that you can see and know how you were created to live. So how do you get to that point? How do you get to that point? Scripture goes on and says, You, O Lord, are the shield about me. You're my glory the lifter of my head. What, what is he talking about there? He, he's saying, God, you're my confidence. When I don't, in the middle of all of his consequences and his crazy feelings, he said, God, somehow you still lift my head and give me hope. How? How? So because I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy heel. What is he talking about? In Jerusalem, on the highest hill, is the temple. That's where God's presence dwells. That's where the daily sacrifices are done. And so what he's done is he looked to God's presence, and he's looking at God's substitute through the sacrificial system that he's covered now. And then even though he's a sinful, selfish man, that he can know God's forgiveness and God's grace. Amen to that. Come on. We know all the things that weigh us down. That's why we they had to look forward to what Christ was going to do. We get to look back to the finished process. So that's why in the middle of your anxiety, if you don't remember anything else, consume yourself with the cross. Anchor your trust to the completed work of Jesus. I didn't say anchor your trust on getting rest. I didn't say anchor your trust on getting relief. I didn't say anchor your trust on finding all the answers to your questions. I didn't say anchor yourself to trying to figure this out once and for all. I didn't, come on. Anchor yourself to the trust in the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his victorious resurrection. And he does something in you and in me to change the anxiety. Man, this is so hard. This is so difficult. But look at the payoff. I lay down and what? What, what is that? What does that tell us? It's told us as he's taken his fear and anxiety and he's placed his trust in God that he's come under God's provision of peace and rest. He's not pursuing rest. He's not pursuing the other things. He's pursuing God, and as he's come under God's authority, then he finds the peace and rest he's looking for. Now, again, I'm trying to be a realist here. Does that say that you're going to sleep 12 hours every night? No. Does that say you're going to go to sleep and sleep just... Great. No. What it's promising is that you'll get the rest that you need. I don't know if that's an hour or two. I don't know what it is, but he's promised to sustain you. Remember, David's on the run. David's got people after him. He's sleeping with one eye open. And in the middle of this, because he's confessed that, God, you are my glory, God, even with 12,000 people about to rout you and kill you, 
about to end your life by saying, we crushed your legacy. And he goes off and he's able to sleep. Oh, there must be something greater than just self-confidence here. There must be, I've got it figured out, or I've got a lot of great bodyguards. No, it's God doing the work. <laughs> and he says, I woke again. And, and, and do you see his demeanor changing? He's just like, woohoo, I woke up. You know, I mean, you see how he's just getting, it's God's transforming his heart. Woohoo, I, I woke up. The Lord sustained me. And what God is doing is developing what I call this beautiful dependency upon Him. You just go, I've, I've told you it's all about you. I've, I've gone ahead and identified, I've pinpointed those things that are causing me fear and anxiety. I, I, I've, I've turned to you and I've focused on your character and I've just tried to obey you in the next move. And then I've repented, I've, I've barfed up all the garbage that I've allowed my, myself to get into. And here you are, just giving me some rest. All oh, that was good. I just needed some rest. He gets to the point where I don't even care if I'm coming after me, ready to get rid of me, because I've got you, God. Can I just remind us, and you don't have to wait for, you know, thankful November where everybody does it for a day where you give all the things where you count your blessings. Uh, and that don't, don't get me wrong, that's a good thing. But you want to get rid of some of the, the anxiety and fear in the middle of what you've got going on. Uh, just look around and be thankful for what God has provided. We so focus on the things that we don't have, we wish we had, we'd like to have, we were had long ago, we'd like to have in the future. And we're so unthankful sometimes. Oh, amazing what, just counting what you do have. As simple as, yes, I do have a roof over my head. I do have some air conditioning. I, I, I do have somebody sitting beside me. I do have a God that cares for me. And you just start going over those things that you're thankful for, those little things. God, you gave me a couple of hours sleep. Woohoo! God, you know, I was just, you know, just in the thick of this, and I just need to get out of the process. And I got out and I walked my dog. And I looked at the radar, and it had been raining all the time. And, and, and I came back uh, to the house, and as soon as I got back to the house, it rained for an hour and a half, and I was just like, yes, God! You know, and did he do that just for me? I don't know, but I'm so thankful just in that little bit that I got to just go, yes, God, yes, God. There is something about an attitude that changes things on how we look at things, how we just have a, a breath to keep going forward when we're thankful about what we do have. Not what we don't have. We wish we had. We could have had. We Come on. Count your blessings. Can you count some blessings? See, that part's so doable. And it finishes here. Now, you would think that maybe David's, you know, got his emotions in check. So I, I love that this is at the end. He's like, arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. And just so you don't think that he's just kind of squelched down his emotions, I love this. Strike all the enemies on the cheek. Kick their teeth out. And you're like, mm. how could he do this? Remember, where is he doing this? In the presence and prayer of the Lord. So is it okay to express all of his anger? Yes. Is it okay to ask God to deal with his enemies. Yes, David never lifted his finger in squelching the coup that was after him. And God took care of it and restored the throne. I believe because of his trust. It offered just this. Salvation belongs to you, God. If, you, if anybody's going to save me, if anybody's going to make me right, if anybody's going to pull this stress of fear away from me, if anybody is going to lift any part of this weight of anxiety that's crushing me, it's you, God. That's where he wants you. And until he gets you there, you 
get to him to this point. Your blessing be on your people. He could even turn and say, I'm going to share what God's been doing, uh, uh, even what I have not been doing for your glory, God. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this is part of your plan. I'm going to be able to walk by Shimei on the way out that's throwing rocks at me and cursing me to my face when I have the power to kill him. And I'm going to take it because maybe there's a grain of salt in it from God. Because, God, you're my glory, not what other people think. Not even what I feel. You're my glory. And, God, I've tried it. I've misplaced my glory on things that, are, that should not be there. And it's destroyed me. It's oppressed me. And I don't want to live that way any longer. So could I just encourage you in this? So if you've been blindsided by anxiety, could I give you hope today that it doesn't have to be your end? It's actually in this divine place, as the band comes up, it's a fresh opportunity. And on purpose, I've saved a couple of the songs at the end today to let us process that. And as I was thinking, you know, really, I, I, I'm i not saying that you're going to be able to sit down all your anxiety and in just a moment walk out of here just free. Could, can I start out here? Could I start out with all the things that you're carrying, the heavy weights that you're carrying? Could you just for a moment do this? Could you just release for a moment and see if God's strong shoulders, mighty hand, can carry it for a moment and let him do a healing work in you. That's what I'm asking you for. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up, if you will. God, this is raw. This is real. This is something that we all face. And we have failed miserably. And I just sense that there are many, even in here at this point, uh, came in here just barely breathing from the oppression of anxiety, trying to figure out how to express their emotions, vent their emotions, swallow their emotions. And God, you've given us a fresh approach. God, thank you for the story of King David. Uh, he wouldn't have wished this on himself, and yet you did a transforming work in his heart and his life that comes forward to today to give us hope. God, you're that good. So I, I would pray for the beginning of a journey. We can't disagree with this, and it works. It, it takes some of our following of you. And so I would pray for the courage for the next breath. God, I thank you for this moment because I, I am so glad that you knew who would be here today. You knew under what weight we would be here today. You knew that you would offer relief and hope today. Oh, God, thank you. We love you. We look to you in these moments. It's in Jesus' name I ask. Amen.